welcome back to another episode of Explosions and Fire. I could start with some news. Earlier in the year, I was complaining because I actually had to write my thesis for my PhD, which was due. I've done that now. It's done. It's done. It's in. So as a new PhD graduate, I get to consider my two career options, finance or the war. Which is why I'm excited to talk to you today about microsecond trading. Yes, what if we taught this circuit board to experience greed? No, um, I'm not emotionally ready for a real job yet, so I'm, I'm staying in academia. But anyway, what we're talking about today are IR countermeasures for air-to-air -air warfare, in which you assume both sides on the war can afford a jet plane. Flares for infrared countermeasures have some really interesting science behind them, so we're going to be talking about that today and making our own flare mix and also making our own pretend missile seeker. It's definitely a pretend missile, pretend seeker, right? We're not going to be making an actually good missile seeker here. That's the kind of activity that moves you from the government watch list to the government actor list. We'll be discussing basically 1960s era tech in this video just because I like the 60s. Modern missiles have probably achieved full sentience and you've got to feed them like complicated Sudokus on their flight over otherwise they would get bored but the MTV flares and the flare technology was used for a very long time and is probably still used a little bit today but very first too much talking already let's make a flare Surely we can make a flare from just things we have lying around the house. We'll get some hexamine here, it'll burn well but not too hot, and some strontium chloride which will make the strontium emission lines. And we've got this expired flare here which is lying around and this bag of potassium perchlorate, why not? We'll mix up a ratio and it, it does burn pretty well, I mean eventually. Uh, we don't want it to go crazy, we're not trying to make it blow up here, but we just want to see some nice colours and, and the red does come through. I think it could probably use some more potassium perchlorate. I just sort of threw this together. If we try again with some more potassium chlorate in the mix, it does burn a little better, but you know, you lose a bit more of that red colour. So there's a bit of an art to the flare mix. But what's up with that expired flare is probably more of the <laughs> important question. Flares have a very limited shelf life and shouldn't be stored or used past their expiry date. I wasn't really expecting them to work that well until I saw it. Made in West Germany. And I knew these were still gonna work way too good for being way past their expiry date. There was still no way I was gonna hold it in my hand though. I just clamped it down because it could just explode into a big fireball and that, that would be very bad. It's hard to know exactly what chemicals are used in a flare, especially a flare that was made in West Germany, but the colour is definitely indicative of strontium. The strontium emission lines is what gives it this beautiful red colour and makes it so bright. <laughs> All right, well, that's a good flare, I guess. I mean, it's a good visible flare, but it would be terrible as a counter IR measure. So why is that? What's, what's so special about IR flares and how do we make them? A hugely influential technology that was developed during World War II was the radar proximity bomb, which allowed bombs to kind of detect when they were close to a plane, which made them a lot more effective. So the idea of self-guided weapons was already around in the 1940s, but they lacked the sensing technology to take it that one step further. Because there is an obvious thing that gives away a plane's position, the amount of heat it gives off. But here lies the challenge of the technology. Most of the thermal radiation given off by a hot plane would be in the kind of 8 to 10 micron band, and that's what she's kind of normally see with a thermal camera. But you know what else releases 8 to 10 microns? The ground and the sun emits a lot of it. And I mean you do. 
But if you're clever about it, there's a much more specific thermal signature that comes from a jet, and that comes from its engines. Apart from just being hotter, so it will emit much more of shorter wavelength radiation, you also have the burning fuel and the CO2 that's emitted, and that will emit a sort of distinct thermal signature. Kind of looks like this. So if you know the missile is looking for this particular thermal signature, your decoy flare needs to have the same thermal signature in order to confuse the missile. So how do we properly replicate the thermal signature of a jet engine? That answer is the MTV flare. The M in MTV stands for magnesium, and this is obviously a very hot burning metal, very flammable metal, but this is paired with a pretty strange oxidizer, Teflon. It's the same chemical that's used to make pans non-stick. I did think for this project I would have to like sand down a whole heap of non-stick pans, but turns out you can just buy grams of this bloody Teflon powder because it's used in bike chains or something. After filming, I'm just going to do a fat line of this Teflon and just have the goddamn slipperiest of insides. Even very crudely mixed, the fine Teflon powder drastically increases the burn rate of the magnesium. It also produces some weird fluorinated smoke, so we won't be breathing this. But things get even more dramatic once we dredge up some magnesium powder. I mean, they're not insane, powerful flash powder mixes, probably because the magnesium powder is really not that fine and is probably really old. They burn really easily and burn very bright. Teflon is known as being a very, very inert substance, so it's a bit of a strange oxidizer here, but it works because magnesium fluoride is such a stable end product. So even though it takes a lot of energy to break all those carbon fluorine bonds, you get all that energy back and more because you're making such a stable magnesium fluoride product. But lots of pyrotechnic mixtures burn really hot. So what makes this particular weird mix of chemicals good as an IR countermeasure? Well, if we look at the plate after the reaction mix is done, we see the secret, unburnt carbon. Because the magnesium has such a high affinity for that fluorine, it produces elemental carbon as a byproduct. Oh. I gotta stop flashbanging myself, what the fuck? Some of the carbon particles will also burn in the air and oxidize, so you'll get this CO2 thermal emission as well. So that's how it mimics the jet engine. We kind of have this secondary glowing hot carbon effect in the air, which makes this nice IR thermal signature. final ingredient for a true MTB flare mix is Viton. So Viton is not quite as resistant to chemicals as Teflon is because there still is some carbon hydrogen bonds there. But the polymer itself has different physical properties and it's much more rubbery and much more flexible than Teflon. Viton is commonly used in really expensive O-rings, which I got some and then realized it was potentially the stupidest way to get a chemical as really well machined O-rings because this pack cost me like 30 bucks. <laughs> uh, found out you could buy just huge sheets of Viton. So we've got this big rubber sheet of the fluoropolymer. You can hack it up into little chunks and put it into an extractor and fill the extractor with acetone and the acetone will slowly dissolve parts of the polymer causing it to swell and, and dissolving just a little bit over time. The role of the Viton is as a binder because you don't want a pyrotechnic mix that's just as a loose powder with, you know, static sensitivity and, and really easy to ignite. So the Viton holds it all together as a sort of a rubbery mass which is more stable to the air and water and it's much easier to handle. You don't sacrifice the performance of the pyrotechnic at all even though it has quite a high amount of binder. After we've isolated the Viton, we can re-dissolve it in some acetone and then just suspend in the Teflon and then the magnesium powder. And then we're going to add this suspension into some hexanes. I mean, here I'm just using shellite because it's from Bunnings and I don't know who else uses this. So I feel like if I stop buying it, Bunnings will stop selling it. So uh, it, it's like a couple bucks and it's like hexanes. It's so good. Bunnings, keep selling this, please. Anyway, this causes the Viton to precipitate really rapidly and is meant to form a bit of a gel. I, I never quite got the art to it. Some shapes I made were a little dry. Some of the stuff I made was a bit too rubbery. But anyway, we did make some shapes of MTV flare mix with the binder and they still burn really well. So we've done it. We've, we've made some MTV flare mix. They burn. The question now becomes, do they make the correct IR thermal signature? It's missile seeker time. Please allow me to, to show some PowerPoint slides. <clears throat> 
Human beings were never meant to see into the IR, and it angers God for us to bear witness to the ghosts that lay increasingly beyond the range of our mortal vision. Therefore, the further into the IR you want to see, the more poisons you have to put into your detector. The visible range is best imaged by silicon detectors, a friendly, non-toxic element. Beyond that, we have the arsenic zone, then we move into the lead zone. Finally, we reach the mercury cadmium telluride zone. <laughs> That's the sensors that are used on normal thermal cameras. Don't eat a thermal camera. Tellurium is not healthy either. Tellurium is not healthy. Okay, sorry, I have more slides. I've got to go back into presentation mode. You might ask, what is beyond 10 micron. It does continue all the way up to 11, perhaps even 12 micron. That is the edge of science. Everything beyond this range belongs to the engineers. So the 2 to 5 micron band is the area where we want and it's a very hard range to image. The best choice is probably like a lead selenide or lead sulfide detector and they're cool detectors. Then They're not cheap and they're also like export controlled. They're hard to buy because people are using them for like missile seekers or whatever. So we've got to get a little bit more creative. This is a thermal pile array. So the sensor technology is made up of just like little resistors that measure changes in heat. So it's kind of a very bad thermal camera. The other drawback is the sensor size is only like 32 by 24 pixels. And this was one of the highest resolution ones I could find. I mean, there were higher resolution ones on eBay, but they were just genuine spyware at this point. It wants to connect to Wi-Fi and USB and like it doesn't need to... <laughs> Instead of just being sensitive to around the 8 to 10 micron range, they have hugely broadband sensitivity. It has an anti-reflection coating, so it can't see visible light, but it should be able to see everything from like 1 to 10 microns. It's got this really broadband sensitivity. So we just need to filter it down to our targeted wavelength range, and we can do that by using sapphires. So Sapphire has really strong absorbance of anything longer than five microns. So by putting it in front of our sensor, it'll block out all that thermal radiation above our targeted range. So using my PhD in optics, I carefully designed a mount to perfectly align this filter. I, I, I hot glued it, I fucking hot glued it. Even I'm ashamed of this handiwork. That's... But God damn it works can't see me at all because I'm not emitting light uh, shorter than five microns but we turn on the butane torch and it sees it perfectly so we now have for like less than two hundred dollars an imaging missile seeker array so fucking eat shit ITAR. <laughs> Who will employ me? I need to be employed. All right, here we're using a small candle as a pretend jet plane for our imaging array to lock onto. The lighting of flare mix completely overwhelms the camera and we lose sight of our target for as long as the flare mix burns, which isn't very long, but it seems pretty easy to overwhelm the sensor from this close. What if we were back, say, 15 meters away? Can we still do it then? Instead of the small candle, this time we're using a big mercury lamp as our pretend jet plane and our imaging sensor once again locks onto the signal very easily. But once our infrared countermeasure lights, we lose easy locking of that signal. So I think it's working. Once again, the burn time isn't very good. So instead of just having a loose pile of powder, I managed to confine it and throttle it a little bit in this cardboard tube. Obviously for an actual device, you would want a much longer burn time because obviously it works as a decoy for as long as it burns. And, and in the 1960s, actual MTV flares generally burn for about 10 seconds. However, they were generally about 250 grams. Yeah. You wouldn't want to be near that yeah. when it went off a ground level, but I, I think our burn rate is reasonably similar. You know, well, I mean, it's not close, but it's not too far off. So we have made some MTV flare mix and confirmed that it does work as an infrared countermeasure. So now we can really go to our ideal goal of this project, which is, is it possible to use air-to-air -air infrared countermeasures to counter a Nintendo Wii? Hey Amen. Yeah, you gotta wear these. Oh, what? I'll get the gas mask. Okay, sure. This doesn't make perfect sense because the Nintendo Wii worked at an IR wavelength, <laughs> just shorter than one micron, but still let me do this science, okay? This is good science. Yeah. So we've got the flare mix here. The Wii sensor bar is just two IR emitting LEDs, which are tracked by the Wii remote. So if we have the IR flare mix that goes off and emits IR light, it should distract the remotes. We should see that cursor on the screen deflect away. So uh, are, you, are you ready for this? Yeah.
bit of work in the sliders? Uh, maybe. I can't tell because I can't see where the crosshairs are. <laughs> I reckon the crosshairs definitely deflected across the screen as we as we lit the stuff up. It's pretty right, but I reckon it definitely worked. How cool was that? That was that was heaps cool. Can we go inside now? All right, that's it. We survived another video. I can buy shirts. The shirts are cool, and they prevent me from having to pretend I'm qualified to get a job in finance. Um, <laughs> I'm never going to get a job, am I? <laughs>